Hello and welcome back to another video on the Wapped Analytics channel. We're back again for the second time today, or second time recording at least. Uh, and we're going to be looking ahead to the game on Friday night against Burnley. It's been, yeah, pretty hectic schedule already. Still no games in the weekend. Um, and we're back here with the, uh, yeah, game after three days off. So seeing as it's the second one of the evening, or the second one of the day, it's about almost 10 o'clock in the evening right now. I'm going to have a drink. Whilst I'm doing this, please excuse me. That is much needed, um, especially somewhat after the last game. Quite a stressful one. So we'll be looking ahead to this one, quite eagerly anticipating it. Um, it's one you kind of picked out at the beginning of the season or when the fixtures came out as a potential you know, big clash. And uh, yeah, it's an important one to, to kind of see how we do against uh, another team around us. We thought Sheffield might be a little bit a little bit more on their game, a little bit sharper. As it turns out, obviously a little bit blunt. And then we've discussed earlier today, um, or yesterday maybe when you're watching this, um, how we got on against West Brom and kind of what a different opponent they were and, and how they affected what we're trying to do. Burnley, again, there's a bit of a concern uh, in regards to that as well, um, how they could stop us. They're a much different team to, to the Burnley last year, the way they operate. They're still in a transitional phase like us. They've been a little bit more active in terms of um, ins and outs. Um, squad transition, changeover has been more substantial. Uh, but, you know, there's there's pros and cons to that as well. So, we'll love to get into that. We'll discuss what we think their strengths and weaknesses are, how the two teams match up, and, and what we think we're likely to see. Um, and how, again, how this Rob Edwards team can come away with three points of Vicarage Road again, hope to make it two wins on the bounce at home. So starting off then, we'll look at Burnley real quick. Make sure this works. Okay. Uh, so firstly, we'll look at their outgoings. And as I said, there's quite a substantial turnover. Um, yeah, notable ones at the top there. The top four, obviously. Collins to Wolves, Cornette to West Ham, Nick Pope to Newcastle and James Tarkovsky to, to Everton. They've brought in considerable, considerable finances, two big fees. Um, pretty decent fee and then you know got some wages at the books but they've lost some key players um, some experienced players that have been part of that team um, it, you know there's quite a lot of losses there really for a team um, like Burnley but you know if, if they are going to lose them then at least let that be in a time of the transitioning and, and changing the way they play obviously they're big players they'd like to keep but there's going to be turnover anyway so they can use those funds and reinvest them in a smart way hopefully uh, and find a way to to help accommodate the change and their uh, new new manager, <clears throat> Vincent Company. So again, we've got a new manager. So yes, he's got some experience in Belgium, but he's somewhat of an un unknown quantity for a lot of us. Uh, but we're starting to see, uh, we're starting to see kind of how he wants to play come through a little bit. There's actually been some interesting behind the scenes stuff with Burnley as well, showing a little bit of company uh, and kind of what we expect from a, a Guardiola disciple in in, in some ways. Uh, but yeah, they're the big ones that have come out. In terms of coming in, um, you know, the names that you're going to stick out here, um, Josh Cullen midfield, Padma Anderlet, and yeah, he's a very accomplished midfielder. He He's a very good, good championship midfielder. I think, you know, he could be playing at a higher level in the championship. He's he's great for what company needs, the sort of football they're trying to play. Definite standout. He's probably my key player to watch for this game. Um, a name that others will also be looking at, Scott Twine, picked up from MK Dons for a, a decent fee, one that Watford fans would have hoped that we'd been looking at. Obviously, we didn't. Um, or if we did, it was very quiet and we, we lost out. But Scott Twine, yeah, uh, interesting signing. Um, obviously, really productive in, in, in League One for MK Dons. And then you've got some others in there as well. You know, we've got some loans. Um, we've got some loans from Man City, uh, which we expect, obviously, that connection to Man City. Um, I quite like actually probably the loan I actually do really like is the is the left back Ian Matson. I think that's a an interesting signing and it really helps Man City. It really, Man City. It really helps Burnley in, in how they're trying to play the fullbacks, the way they're going to operate, the way those wide midfielders are going to operate is going to be a little bit more offensive and they've got to have the quality there. So adding that is a, is a really interesting one. Um, and they've done a good job, I'd say, of reshaping the squad for pretty relatively low figures. I mean, I know there's other fees which we, we don't see included in the deals here, but. 
you know, we're talking about four million, three point three million, three point three million again, three million two. It's not a lot of money um, with parachute payments and what they've brought in. It's really substantial, uh, and they've done quite good work. I'd say if you're a Burnley fan, you're probably quite pleased with the business. Yes, they've got some holes in some places. They've got some injury concerns as well, but um, they've they've shaped a pretty good squad. We'll get on the injury concerns because that's quite important for us. Um, and for Watford fans, there's a couple of you know key misses for Burnley we should be quite you know relieved about um, Burnley rem- will remain without Scott Twine and Joe Rodriguez the championship ch- clash at Watford on Friday night that's you know huge um, huge for us really um, it is important um, two big players that are going to be out of action I think that's the main absentees um, yes yeah, so they're the two main ones Twine, Rodriguez, you know they're, they're a better team with them, um, so I, I'm I'm pleased they're out. Um, it's, it's it's helpful to us because we need every every bit of help we can get in these sorts of situations. So looking at Burnley, we can have a look a bit over their first two games. Let's try and get understanding also because they're a little bit different from each other, other the way they approached. Uh, we'll talk about how they play um, as well. So looking at the first game of the season, Huddersfield. I thought they played against a bad Huddersfield team. Um, Burnley were quite good. Don't get me wrong, but I thought that. The Huddersfield are very passive, and they weren't able to really stamp their authority in the game. You can kind of see some of the ratings here, actually. Interestingly, too, Charlie Taylor playing centre back. You know, he's he's got that left sided that left sided um, presence. He's got pace. Um, he's actually a good defender in in one on one situations too. And when you're be playing high at the pitch, you're going to be leaving space behind you. You've got something that can cover him and play in that manner. I think that's a good option, especially when we are progressing or when Burnley are progressing those fullbacks up. You look at Connor Roberts on the right hand side, uh, Matson on the left. They're going to have space going forwards. They're going to leave a bit of space behind, having that lateral movement, but also the vertical. It's ideal for a centre back and. It's interesting to see Charlie Taylor playing there, but he's he's doing pretty well by all accounts. So, uh, first game we saw, you know, four three three. Um, it, it's a little bit different to what you might expect. You know, you think in company replicating somewhat of a Guardiola approach, you might expect someone a little bit of a false nine in there. With the players they've got, Ashley Barnes is available, and he's obviously more of a focal point, um, someone that can be active in the box. But you look at the players that are really kind of making the difference here. You've got Josh Cullen. Um, again, he was he was dominant in that game. Uh, really good performance from him. You look at the ground that he's covered. You know, active in the central midfield. Um, played the full 90 minutes. A passing accuracy of 96%. With considering the quantity of passes, 81 passes in that game. That's almost as many passes as Watford played. Um, or Watford completed and, um, and played <laughs> the other night against West Brom. Key passes two. Seven out of eight long balls completed. Uh, created a big chance. He had a shot. Completed both of his dribbles, won his ground jewels pretty much, not so much in the air, got back and defended a little bit, you know, won a couple of fouls. He was just dominant. And if you watch that game, I'm sure he stood out. He was active, he was aggressive, um, really good player. I like, enjoyed watching him a lot. Um, Matson as well on the left. You know, look at the heat map, he's high up the pitch. Um, obviously got a goal in this one as well. Uh, defensively good, you know, solid. He's getting touches, uh, getting lots of passes off, getting crosses into the box. Uh, and so on. You know, shots obviously scored the goal. You look at some of the movement too. You know, Ashley Barnes not heavily involved. How many touches did he have? Twenty four touches. Um for a striker that that played ninety minutes, pretty low. But it just shows the kind of creativity is not gonna built around around Ashley Barnes. And they came away with the the one they win against uh, as I said, a poor Huddersfield town. and um, they could have or should have maybe created some more clear cut chances or at least finished some more. Let's have a look at the game here. We can have a look at the um we can have a look at the XG map against Huddersfield. Yes, yeah, so there's a big chances. 1.42 to, to Huddersfield 0.16. Um, speculative efforts from just outside the box. And, you know, Burnley had two big opportunities. Um, neither of the ones that were scored is actually Matson's. Um, that was finished with a 4% probability. But, yeah, so that was the first game. And then you look at the second game as well against Luton. Quite a different one. Um, actually, one thing I want to look at as well, sorry. Just going back to the Huddersfield. You look at the dominance here. Um, you see the momentum uh, tracker there. It's all Burnley, really. Apart from a couple of brief little stints from Huddersfield, it's all Burnley. So, yeah, worth noting. Um, and actually, we'll look at their passing network as well. Um, we'll have a quick look there. Bear with me. Once we double check that. So, Huddersfield Town. 
And we'll check out just the parsing network, see what those create creations that like the, the link ups, so we say, look like. Um, yeah, fallback to fallback expected. So it, again, we're showing the the width pushing up the pitch, um, how they operate there. It's interesting to see how many Mullen Roberts, yeah, very active. And then also Matson. You look at Matson's average position, heart of the pitch there. They're effectively playing as wingers. You're, they're allowing those those wingers to tuck in and play in more advanced central roles because they get so much width from the fullback and they trust the fullbacks to be offensive but have that defensive stability and, and capability of obviously coming back and defending. But they they defend with the pressure they apply on you offensively too. You know that's part of their style. Um, so moving on to the next game. We'll look at the uh, the game versus Luton Town. They switched a little bit. They switched to the four four two, a little bit more mobility. Um, still kept Ashley Barnes, of course. They do have those injury concerns, uh, but they they switched things up a little bit. And it wasn't. It's difficult. They weren't as dominant in this game. Um, really strong start from Luton. And I hate to say it, but you can take some lessons away from Luton in this game. Similar shape. They played with the three at back. They made it difficult for, for Burnley. They made it difficult for them to operate, and they, they were good at closing down the space. The difference is here, the key difference is when you look at this this back three of Luton is the outside centre-backs. I'll show in parts that the way they operate uh, as wide centre-backs, they're almost more full-backs converted into playing in that centre-back position. We said it earlier, um, we talked about those centre-back positions. You can't look at the outside, or you shouldn't maybe look at the outside centre-backs as centre-backs. Yes, we plug in, you know, Cabaselli, Cathcart, they're centre-backs, right? But it's, it's a different position, the same way that you have to clarify between a wing back and a right back, a right wing back and a right back. There's different expectations you have of them and different primary attributes you expect of them. We're playing centre backs on the outside, not outside centre backs. Whereas here they've converted the full back, and they've got the outside centre back playing in those positions. So what that does give you, it gives you flexibility. Um, positionally but also physically the flexibility the, the adaptability of those players to compete against those more um, nimble attacking players on the wings they're able to match them up a little bit more physically and that, and that helps them with the bend the flexibility they need that and we don't really have that right now so again there's another position we've talked about we need to improve on and um, the left is meant to be worked on the right hopefully Mario Gaspar or someone similar um, but yeah so they have a little bit of flexibility there They've got the work rate on the wings, and they have the industry in midfield, um, with also a little bit of creativity as well, and then the kind of the versatility in the striking positions. Harry Cornick's a, a good carrier of the ball, and then Adebayo can be physical and you know, be some of a problem. I wonder if this game is the game for Edwards where he does decide to. We'll get into this further, but if this is the game he decides to drop one of the front three uh, and bring someone like Ray Menage in for uh, the, the variety and attacking threat, especially if we are looking to be a little bit more possession-based and try and control the ball a little bit more, do we look for someone that's, I don't mean to say a lot of the term outlet, but somewhat of a, a bouncing board in, in the forward positions, potentially. Um, they did much the same. They weren't as dominant this game. Luton started the game here. You can see the momentum, tra momentum tracker. They were more aggressive early on, which is, of course, where they got their goal. Um, but they, they struggled a little bit more. Burnley still had 71% possession, very similar to what West Brom had against us. Um, but, you know, you look at the shots taken there as well. Luton still edged it on the shots. Um, they got more shots on target. Um, just trying to go for numbers here. You know, passes 594 to, to, to Luton's 246, only 57 completed. 140 accurate passes in 90 minutes to 487 of Burnley. Uh, dribbles, you know, pretty even. Possession lost, obviously Burnley lost the ball a lot, but they're playing it a lot more, you expect that. And yeah, it's 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 a team, it's a game where, you know, Luton sat in, I'm not sure, I'm sure quite a few, few of you probably watched this game. Um, because when it's televised, but Luton sat in, they were disruptive, and it was difficult for for, for Burnley uh, to really break them down. Because whilst they're they're playing with a more positive style, and um, they're trying to be a little more creative, I, I thought the change in shape didn't match up well with with how Luton played. Uh, and maybe maybe company sees that back three and thinks, you know what, I want to. I don't want to put three against three with my front three. I want to try and, and work space and, and take advantage of the of, of the space in other areas and try and you know capitalize on those those gaps that are left by that five at the back system by playing a little bit different. But it didn't really work, and part of that's personnel. 
Um, part of that's execution, and also part of that's good planning from Nathan Jones for Luton. So, uh, I'll kind of look at Josh Khan here as well and see what kind of different performance he had. Not quite as efficient in possession. Obviously, passing options, uh, lanes are changed by the, the, the shape they're playing with. Still solid in his duels. You know, still had some defensive input, um, but not really getting the shots away. You know, not having as much of an impact in the game. You kind of look at key passes, crosses. It's all down. Um, it's not as effective, and that's not just the formation. It's also the opponent too. It's a better opponent, leading or a better team than Huddersfield, um, I believe. But you know, it's, it's something worth noting. Worth noting. I should look at Jack Cork for a second. Um, we're going to look at some player statistics, trying to get an idea of the the amount of possession some of these players are having here. We'll just look at Burnley. Yeah, so we're getting some pretty high numbers. I mean, you know, Conor Roberts getting a lot of the ball. Um, that right hand side is used quite a lot. We'll clarify that real quick. So look at his passing network against Luton. Sorry. This right hand side should be heavy. Yes, the right hand side is very heavy. Um, he's very active, and there's a connection there. Who's that connection with? Okay. Okay, so two's actually Bree playing there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's very active on the right-hand side. So the right-back position is 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 somewhere which is, you know, heavily involved. Oh wait, that's why I'm looking at. Hold on, better with me here. I'm looking at Luton, aren't I? Stupid. There we go. There's the right-hand side. Connor Roberts, Brownhill, heavy link. Cork, heavy link. Yeah. Yeah, that's the area again. It's the right hand side. So, you know, as we talked about with Millwall, are you able to to dominate that or to close that down? Um, as we hope we would do with the, the right hand side of West Brom. Hopefully, can camera be on the left hand side and you know find that balance? I hope so because it's another one we have to be careful of. Now, the question is, what shape did Burnley play? It's hard to tell because ultimately it wasn't successful against. Um, Against Luton, I think they were more effective in the three. I, I think that'd be more effective against us too, especially with the way we um, we look to play. But in terms of how they play, we'll look actually quick at just the XG model against um, against Luton Town as well. Um, Luton Town, all right. Just looking at the shot map here. You know, Luton had a number of chances, but relatively low quality. Burnley are quite heavily reduced to shots outside the box. Part of that is the way that Luton can be, you know, disruptive, also get back and defend deep and, and limit opponents. But yeah, Barnes is the biggest the highest probability attempt. Interesting. Okay. So it's talking about how they actually um, how they actually operate real quick. I'll go over this quick for you. I'll try and visualize it real quick. Hopefully it stays. Okay, good. All right. Let's try and get rid of some of these ads. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in again, by the way. I know it's been a, a few videos in a couple of days, and it's been a lot, uh, as well as podcasts coming and, you know, all sorts. But again, thanks for tuning in and appreciate the feedback as well. Um, so talking about shaper against us obviously we expect the shape to be the same do we make some changes do we play with an attacking midfielder uh bring those strikers in a little bit more narrow um could we have you know could we see pedro um Minaj or could we see pedro a little bit further forward here maybe maybe someone more advanced gosling even wants to be a little safe a little bit cautious or you know domingos quina espria um and then see maybe so on the other side too are we going to go in that route uh route sorry or are we going to be tempted as rugby tempted to play that front three again and try and find them because we know that possession is the problem can we break lines of this team yes we can I, I think even with the midfield we have we should be able to be able to pass a little bit more the problem is you're going to be facing a team that's going to look to dominate you in possession again how do we react to that hopefully better than what we did to west brom it's not going to be as fast paced and as aggressive as west brom most likely but there is going to be a lot of um, emphasis play placed on that possession uh, football. So the worry for me is this. You know, let's just say, let's just say hypothetically, they play with that three. They're getting players forwards. 
and they're committing defenders and it's the full backs that worry me because look we we have to help out our outside center backs physically they're not really capable um, of, of controlling or containing these wingers on their own you're effectively doubling up in these spaces you're having to help out you're having to get them into position but the problem is what Burnley have been doing uh, and where we are starting to see that kind of school of Guardiola come through is the way they're using those fullbacks because this ultimately is the position the company wants his team in when in attacking situations you're creating that front flat four we're advancing Jack Cork is the anchor and you're playing with a back three at this point okay so this is where Burnley are this is where Burnley want the ball this is how they want to play when you're in this position we're forcing to contain maybe getting players back here probably Pedro or whoever it's going to be coming back to help as well and this is where Burnley want the ball because what we're, what we're always looking for is space, options, uh, creativity. And against the back three, this can be dangerous. Now, you have to be, what you want to be able to do is be disciplined. You want to have flexibility in the outsides. You want to say, okay, we're good. We can control. Wing backs, you're covering the full backs. This is how we're going to defend. It's going to be three on three, you know, man on man, and you've got, then you've got the one player to defend. The problem is, as I said, we're looking to defend in groups because we're having to cover for the physicality. How much space these fullbacks going to have? Matson on the left. This is the issue. Are we get the ball here? Balls into the box. The wingers looking for inverted balls into the box. You've got the come forward, cut back, of course. But you've also got the cut in, the likes of Brownhill. Cut in, left foot, dart across the box. It's, it's very creative. It's attacking. It's difficult to deal with. Those angled balls across the box, such as that, the cut back and cross, very hard to pick up as a defender. And we saw some of the movement was a little bit stagnant, a little bit slow against West Brom. We have to be switched on there. Um, that's the main, the main issue I'm worried about. When Burnley get into this position, that's when we've got to be really switched on. We have to try and break it as quickly as possible. Uh, and that comes down to the activity of these guys in midfield. Are they quick enough to snap in there, win the ball back, turn over, and can we break? I think it's going to be a game of breaking for us. Even at home, I think we're going to have to look for the opportunity to counter. Um, but the question is, does Rob go with the, the speed and, and power of Dennis, Saar, and Pedro? Or did he add a little bit more of the, the robustness of Minaj to help try and dominate the ball? It's, it's a question of whether we try to approach it in a more aggressive, imposing way. Or if we look to counter what Burnley are going to do, I'm fascinated to see how we approach it because you know it's a real, it's a question of philosophy, but um, it's one that's up for debate. But that does bring me to the next kind of topic, actually not topic necessarily, but it's kind of along the same lines um, in regards to how we play and how we've been playing, and that's that's team selection and. We've talked about how maybe Rob Edwards hasn't been given the tools to necessarily fit what he's trying to do. We've kind of outlined that here with. Um, with the outside centre backs and also midfield, we've talked about a fair amount, so I won't beat that to death again. But um, yeah, he's maybe not given the right tools. But then you've got the other hand. On the other hand, is the the quality um, in the front three is that ho not holding us back necessarily? But is it kind of forcing us to play in a way that which maybe Rob isn't as comfortable with or maybe wasn't intending? You know, going into pre-season, he probably didn't expect to have these players as, as long as he's had them. Um, the things he's worked around, the things he's done at Forest Green Rovers, they're more based towards a different style of different style of play, a different sort of system. But it's difficult when you have that quality, you want to put them in the team. And I completely understand the, the mindset of thinking, let's put our best players on the pitch um, right now and play them. But are we losing something? We're clearly struggling in, in midfield. Um, we're struggling to progress the ball. Is that is that something we can rectify by taking one of those players out and, and maybe being a little bit more sparing with how we're using them? You know, the obvious one to take out ourselves after the last game would have to be Dennis, who's a bit of a non-factor. Uh, do, do we look at that and think, yeah, maybe we should adapt a little bit and try and find a balance this team? Because balance is the thing we've been lacking, um, whether it be the centre-back position, the outside centre-back, sorry. Um, the, the, the right wing-back being a left wing-back playing on his weaker side, these are all things we have to consider and, and can we kind of find a little bit of that happy medium by making some adjustments and, and finding some ways to, to get these players back into a position which benefits them and, and can benefit the team uh, from a more uh, holistic approach. That's a question and I'm not entirely sure. I think 
It's going to be tough to say. Uh, it doesn't look like more is going to happen transfer wise between now and then. I think we're very much going to go in with the same squad, obviously, in a couple of days. I don't think we can see comings or goings. Um, we still have the same injury concerns. You know, we're still not. We're still waiting for losers to come back. So it's not. It's not going to be too much change. I think it's going to be pretty similar. Obviously, the the rumor has come out today. I'm sure some of you have seen about Tom Daly Bashiru potentially tearing his ACL. Um, in which case, we'd have to be looking for a midfielder. There's been links to to a few Shadri from from Leicester and so on. But I do think we still need someone there to help that midfield because as of now. They're not quite functional yet. Um, so whether we try to put a plaster over that, spray the urgent on and put in a Dan Gosling or Domingos Quina or a Spria to, to help and add a little bit of a different element, that remains to be seen. So last thing we'll do, we'll have a look at Burnley just real quick. Um, as I said in the last video regarding the, the previous game, we won't take too much from, from these sorts of kind of rankings at this point because it's so early on. Uh, we'll, but we'll have a look and we'll keep an eye on it as we go through. Uh, expected goals, XG per shot, we're at Bernie looking. So there are pretty low down. Yeah, so pretty decent actually. Um, yeah, they've. Uh, oh, it's expected goals. Sorry, I'm not talking about it. It's not good actually. Per shot is pretty low. I was thinking there's expected goals against. So yeah, per, per shot. Pretty low actually, considering the amount of shots they're taking, they're not they're not getting a ton um, with high probability chances. Expected goals against, which is where I thought it was per shot. They are right at the top. Okay, so limiting still. Uh, ball possession, we're going to see them right around the top as well, I imagine. Yeah, second for ball possession, averaging averaging sixty seven percent. Where are we? Averaging forty two over the first two games. Interesting. Part of that's just honestly last night. Um, attacking, we'll just see if they're around the top here. A lot of shots away. That's why their, that's why their percentage of xG per shot is low because they're getting so such a high quantity. Touches in the penalty area, active, getting balls into the box. We talked about those wingers getting narrow. Uh, fullback support. Um, Offsides at the top. Interesting around the top. Okay, and then I'm going to look at construction. I want to see progressive progressive passes. They should be quite high. Per 90, yeah, top, as you'd expect from a team that's playing in the manner they're playing. You know, possession-based football and advancing up the pitch. Um, through possession, they're going to be high in progressive passes, maybe a little bit lower. Oh, excuse me. Maybe a little bit lower in progressive runs. A little bit lower. Okay, and I see the passing rate should be in the top, you imagine, as well. Yeah, second in the passing rate. Interesting, okay. And then we'll just look at defense. I want to see that how passive they've been off the ball. So challenge intensity. Okay. So right at the top there, and then passes per defensive action. So how many passes are they allowing? Very low, six. So winning the ball back quite quick as well. Interesting. So yeah, these are all things we've got to be aware of, cognizant of. Obviously, at this point, we're taking into consideration the opponent, um, who they've been up against. It's all relative, especially this early on. It's a small sample size. We've got to look at it as a game-by-game -game basis and try and draw what we can from this bigger picture stuff at this stage. Um, so yeah, I won't keep you too much longer. I don't want to overload you with, um, uh, with content over there. The next couple of days, but I wanted to get this one out um, just to have a look at Burnley. Obviously, we'll be discussing the West Brom, st Bros West Brom game still on the Waffle Buzz podcast, as well as um, the, the game coming up as well shortly against Burnley. We'll be discussing the fallout of that. Uh, the fixtures have been coming thick and fast, so yeah, try and stay up to date with everything you're following and, and watching the games, and hopefully, we'll come away with another three points. So, again, just want to say thank you for the feedback, um, all the I've messages, comments that I've, I've had over the last however long, really, just talking, sending in messages, discussing things. Um, it's always appreciated. So, yeah, please feel free to get in touch and have a chat about anything, whether you just want to talk about the game or whatever it is. I'm always happy to talk to uh, other Watford fans and, yeah, keep the conversation open. So thanks again for watching. Please like, subscribe if you haven't already. Follow me on Twitter at Watford Analytics at Jordan Weimer. Super hot, hot in here, so if I look shiny and sweaty, apologies for that. Um, 
And yeah, thanks again for watching and enjoy the game on Friday. I hope you come away with another three points.